Bright Rock believes that with every change in life comes opportunity. And the budget speech isn't any different. The minister's speech means change for us all. Because whether the numbers are big or small, change always counts. This budget speech 2023 special edition of the Biz News Power Hour was illuminated by Brightrock, the first ever needs match life insurance that changes as your life changes. Well, I'm Renna van Tilburg for Biz News, and I have Netso Sorbequa from Standard & Poor Global with me, a political risk analysis, to find out what investors might want in this budget, the 2023 and it happens as we have stage six load shedding this week. And there's rumors that we've just heard of stage eight load shedding. Um, hello, Neto, and welcome to Biz News. Yeah, hi, Linda. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to your listeners. Um, yeah, uh, troubling times. Um, but this is not something that's new to us. We looked at the structural issues and we knew that it was never going to be a quick fix. And we, in fact, forecasted that we'd likely see increased stages of load shedding coming into 2023 anyway. So there we go. So what would investors want from this budget? Well, the investors would be looking at a couple of, I think, key things. Um, revenue collection, uh, what it is that uh, the minister thinks is going to happen from an ESCOM debt perspective. We saw in the midterm budget policy statement or the MBT, MBTPS from last year that um, government was, was happy to take in part of that $400 billion, billion rand um, debt from ESCOM and uh, to try and help ESCOM in its restructuring or unbundling um, initiative. So we're going to want to see, are we going to be spending more money than what has already been said? Um, we're going to want to look at the renewables program. Um, as well as the emergency procurement pr program. I mean, do we have money uh, to get in diesel? Do we have money to fire up coal power stations in the short term? I think these are some of the things that um, investors are going to want to look at. Of course, there's going to be the whole issue about the public sector wage bill. Um, that's worth talking about. I think we come to that a little bit later. Um, and then, of course, the GDP growth um, prospects. Uh, and what does that mean? Uh, there and after in, in terms of the more medium to long term. So I think those are some key highlights or, or key points of interest for investors. I think what many people noted is that they're always expecting a lot from a speech like Sona from Mr. Robert Boza, and then he doesn't quite deliver. And you know, in, and Mr. Godawana um, can't really deliver if there isn't you know, policy decisions that enables him to do some sub having surprises. So nobody seems to be accepting any positive or really good surprises, do you, do you think we can expect any? Well, Lala, I do think, Linda, that um, we may not see positive surprises. I think the structural issues are so um, real that there's really nothing too surprising to come out of it. Look, the revenue collection has been great, and that's a positive. The revenue collection has been great. I think we got about 20 to 30 billion more than we anticipated. And a big reason for that was because of the commodity boom, 2020 and 2021, in which the mining sector helped to spruce up that. We also saw, I think, as a result of, of that commodity boom um, and the efficiency of the South African res um, Revenue Collection Services, or SARS, uh, this, this increase. And that's a positive in terms of revenue. What this would likely do is ensure that we don't see increased corporate taxes because there's this unexpected windfall from these great revenue collections. And so we are unlikely going to see an increase in taxes. Um, we also saw, um, I think, the fact that uh, we've got about 1.2 million jobs that have come up. And this is really great, having lost 2 million due to COVID. And, and this speaks to um, the infrastructure sector more than anything else being one that's beginning to drive some economic recovery. So, I mean, those are positives, um, uh, probably the best that we can see. I don't think they're surprises, though, um, but yeah. Yeah, and what about the other SOEs? I mean, Transnet, do you see light in the end of that tunnel? Oh, dear. That's difficult. We've got um, 
an embargo that was put on exports, for instance, of Afaris metals towards the end of last year. And that was because there's just so much vandalism taking place in Transnet. We also saw a cyber attack uh, the year before um, targeting Transnet. We've also seen um, the derailment of 100 uh, cargo trails um, at, at different times. Um, some some focused sabotage where operations are concerned um, at competing, um, according to media reports, competing interests in the freight services industry, which has caused quite a number of these um, of these targeted uh, sabotage attempts. And so, we need to see security spruced up in that sector. We need to see the 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 freight services being um, helped out in in terms of that. And I think. That that's going to help stabilize things. I mean, obviously, this also means that exports are being hampered, and this has knock-on effects to adjacent industries like agriculture, or motor, um, or automobiles industry, etc. So, we are hopeful. I mean, we don't know, and we don't think that in this budget there's going to be more expenditure towards SOEs. Um, but this is how it began at the beginning of last year's budget speech. And by the time we got to the midterms, um, the minister had to look at where the demands are, had to assess whether or not they were worth spending on, and in the end ended up spending about another 30 billion towards SOEs. 24 of those went towards Samrol, um, and then some went towards Denal and others towards Transnet. And so and we anticipate something similar. Perhaps the midterm budget policy statement may give us a, a more realistic picture once things like the wage negotiations take place, because those haven't taken place yet. And so we are likely going to see that expenditure re revealed. But once they take place, much like what has happened in the past two years, where um, they've been very adamant, we're not going to you know, spend more in, in terms of public wages, they ended up giving 3%. We think that something similar might end up happening here both towards the public wage bill as well as the SOEs that you're speaking about. We may end up having assessed the needs and the demands, spending the money that we may not have intended to do so. Um, having said that, um, you know, I, I particularly with the public wage wages, we're going towards an election year in 2024, and there's going to be increased pressure, particularly from alliance partners such as Kasatu, to ensure that there is some sort of being taken care of the public sector in order to get the support necessary in those elections. And so government is going to be, um, and then the ruling party is going to be under some serious pressure to to come to the negotiation table, even though that much rather not. Um, and like I said, I think the midterm budget speech would give us a clearer picture of that, as has been the case in the previous financial year. When I spoke to you in December, just after Mr. Ramaphosa was re-elected, you said you were cautiously more optimistic because he managed to retain power. But we were looking for the buffalo to gain some momentum. Has he? Uh, I, I, I am afraid. I don't think he has. I think that um, what we're likely going to see, and I'm going to speak here to ESCOM because that's the real crippling um, uh, structural issue at the moment. We saw him in Suriname mention a couple of policy adjustments to try and get this momentum. So he put together, um, or rather he announced the state of disaster, and this was going to allow him to spend money, uh, get some emergency procurements in place. And we think that that is likely going to happen. We do think that he's probably going to be able to be able to use money to buy things like gas and diesel for the open um, gas turbines in the short term to ensure that we've got um, the electricity beginning to pump. We think we already know that he's already uh, exempted some industries, particularly critical care like healthcare, from load shedding. And we think these are positive steps because it speaks to using instruments within government to intervene crucially. Um, but at the same time, I think what he thought he was doing by taking the electricity problem and bringing it closer to the presidency and bringing it closer to himself through the creation of this minister of electricity was to have a more swift, more agile response to the issues by being, you know, a, a fingertips away from the issues. But instead, we think that he somehow caused some sort of policy complications for himself because ESCOM reports to the Minister of Public Enterprises 
However, the Minister of Minerals and Energy is necessary for licensing of diesel and many other energy-related issues. More than that, you've then got to have the Minister of Finance involved from a procurement perspective. Then you've got to have the Minister of Environmental Affairs in, involved in, in order to ensure that ships dock and are doing things uh, properly. And now you're going to have a Minister of Electricity. It's about five ministers by my account. And, and what we think this points to is um, complicating an already complex system. But um, perhaps if he gets it right, he may be able to ensure that the decisions that are made, particularly from an operations perspective, this minister's scope is more granular in, in, in nature. So which power stations are currently problematic? Which are generating units are the ones that we need to pay attention to? And how do you respond as swiftly as possible? But like I said, um, you know, it's going to be difficult. The reason for this, Linda, is because even historically, even before 1994, the SREs have always been aligned to some sort of political interest. It's always been about trying to um, improve a particular sector of the economy or um, servicing a particular sector of the economy. And ESCOM for the longest time has been servicing our coal miners. And we've seen that because there's a very strong lobby where that's concerned. If we get to move away from that towards renewable energy, it means that the SRE is not going to be servicing another sector or interest group within, it, within society. And so you can't run away from the politics by involving a minister. Um, you know, really, it's, it's more long term, it's more incremental, and uh, it's more complex than, than he may have made it seem when he announced this magic wand of a minister in, in the presidency for electricity. Yeah, and that's not what South Africans want. They want a quick solution. Um, well, you talked about um, the election just being not far away. Um, and, we, we now, and you talked about ships docking. And there's a ship that docked in South Africa, a Russian warship. We can't, you know, you're a political analyst. We can't let you off before asking you about this. How do investors view this? You know, it might be just political games, but could it put off investors from South Africa and especially from the West? Well, Linda, um, we don't, our baseline, our baseline forecast is that we don't think this is going to cause um, significantly disruptive relationships between the West and South Africa. Uh, and there's another reason for this, and I think maybe there was going into it. In the first place, South Africa is already part of BRICS. Relations with Russia and China are expected. Um, you know, to the defense of the South African uh, government, uh, the Minister of International Affairs uh, did say that this had been planned since COVID. And so I, we, we understand why the timing of this as particularly precarious. Um, and, and, and we also think that South Africa would not be wanting to rock the boat in terms of its Western allies and its relationships, particularly with the EU, which remains a very significant trading partner. There's also that 8.5 billion um, that has been uh, secured in pledges from the West towards South Africa's just transition um, policy, which is a very important part of the electricity restructuring. Also, by the way, one of the things that the Minister of Electricity's portfolio will be looking at is just transition as well as climate control over and above those granular details about um, operations that I spoke to you about. And as a result, all of those issues, we don't even think that the US, according to our analysts in Kraft, um, especially our US colleagues, we don't even think that the US would necessarily try to impose sanctions or try to deteriorate relationships. We understand that this has gotten a lot of media coverage and has resulted in quite a lot of criticism, even internally. We've seen our opposition parties in South Africa criticize this as being some sort of tacit um, uh, support for Russia in the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, but our analysis um, and, our, and our expertise point to the fact that this is unfortunate timing, but we don't think that this will necessarily result in, in negative sentiment for investment. Yeah, it is unfortunate timing because it's exactly a year that the Russian tanks rolled into Ukraine. So, yeah, I'm still recording it. <laughs> so are you expecting the minister to increase the budget deficit or will he resist calls for that? 
And then do we think that he's going to have to revise the budget deficit? And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. I think, like I had already mentioned, there's been a commodity boom. You know, this has helped in terms of revenues. But there are a couple of things that we're not going to have moving forward. For instance, demand is going to drop significantly. You've already got um, a global uh, kind of uh, uh, um, demand and, and inflation and economic growth dwindling, and that's going to impact South Africa's growth. And then, of course, Linda, um, moving forward, we also know that uh, there's, there's the, the growth prospects are going to drop. I mean, currently for the current fiscal deficit, it's around 4.5 of GDP for 2023-2024. But we think that um, this is likely going to increase to about um, point, about 5% of GDP in 2023, 2024, and that speaks to that kind of revision. So the necessities and the fact that he's not going to be able to have what he's had this year, the commodity boom, the increased jobs, about 1.2 million, um, it's going to mean that growth prospects dwindle, and that means that uh, the deficit is likely going to increase beyond this year. Yeah, and growth is, as you say, dwindling. Where do you can you do you know where it will end up? You know, for the year. Yeah, and like any idea what we could expect. Yeah, the fiscal projections um, are, are really difficult at this time. Uh, you know, we, we've we've got projections by economists moving from zero point three percent to about one point four percent. As S and P Global Market Intelligence, um, we've set this at about zero point seven percent. And, and there are a number of reasons for this. I mean, ESCOM is clear, but I think there are a couple of other things that we spoke about in, in a different conversations that are not at the surface and that are going to drag growth. Uh, water and water infrastructure supply is a big one. We've already started to see some water restrictions take place in metropolitan such as uh, Tuane, the capital city of the country. We expect these to continue on and off in Durban and in the Eastern Cape, which are industrial uh, hubs of the country. More than that, fuel and fuel shortages, the fact that we don't have the refining capacity we used to have because of the shutting down of big oil refineries, means that we are more vulnerable to any shocks that may hinder imports of fuel. This is going to impact, like we said, electricity generation, but also a whole lot of industries that are heavy on fuel, including mining, which has been responsible for such great growth previously. So outside of electricity, water and fuel are likely also going to drag growth. And those are not to the fore. And then part of our analysis as uh, S&P Global Market Intelligence has factored that in. And we see this sitting at around 0.7%. Oh, very. Oh, Neto, always lovely speaking to you. Such interesting perspectives. Um, thank you for speaking to Business Neto Sobekwa from SAP Global. Thank you. You're very welcome, Linda. Thank you for having me. Bright Rock believes that with every change in life comes opportunity. And the budget speech isn't any different. The minister's speech means change for us all. Because whether the numbers are big or small, change always counts. This Budget Speech 2023 Special Edition of the Biz News Power Hour was illuminated by BrightRock, the first ever needs-matched life insurance that changes as your life changes.